Okay, all right. Um, and I want to have a good conversation, a deep conversation. If it gets uncomfortable, that's fine too. That's how we really, you know, get to the root of some of these problems and issues. Um, I'm no expert. Um, you guys are in your own experiences and in your professional uh, area of study and work. So I want you guys to almost help me as we as we talk tonight. So first of all, I'm Leland. Uh, I anchor the five o'clock show at CBS six, and I report at eleven. Uh, pretty new here. Been here about three months in Richmond, and so. I'm still learning the community and learning what issues matter to Richmonders, and this is something that I was um, happy to be a part of when the station approached me about it. So that's my deal. We'll start with you. You want to go around the table? This is Charles Willis. Ladies first. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Henderson. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sandy Henderson. I'm a, a clinical child psychologist, and I have a private practice here. I, I taught at VCU for several years, and now I'm just doing private practice with basically three to 15 year olds, I do do older adolescents too and some college age kids. Um, and it's been quite a pandemic experience. Um, I went from working three, three days a week to literally working every day a week, including Saturday and Sunday for a year. I mean, it has been absolutely off the chain. Um, the levels of need, it's been frantic almost. People have been, um, they, they have been at, at levels of mental health distress that I've never seen in my whole career. So, I know you probably have seen this. I'm just over here nodding. Yeah, Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Sharnessa Pleasant. I go by Charlie. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I am in private practice here. I've been practicing for about six years, and. Um, just as Dr. Sandy mentioned, everything has just been haywire since 2020 with the pandemic. Um, the need for mental health services has increased. The um, just it, It's been very overwhelming, but I've been grateful to be in a place to serve and be able to step up in that way. So i um, just happy to be amongst colleagues and community members this evening. Hopefully we get to learn something about each other tonight. Um, I've always said this, um, that I'm going to start calling myself, hi, I'm Cassie's mom. Um, my name is Patricia Godsey. My daughter was Cassie, and she passed away from an overdose on January 22nd of this year. So um, in terms of things being bad, they were bad for me for 10 years, and for her, horrible for 10 years. Um, so I've learned a lot about the system. I know some things, well, really nothing works. Um, but I could have a lot of input on improvements, things that may be done differently, because it's not good. So, so I'm Christina Dolan. Um, I have my own private practice called Ice Eggs. Um, I've been within private practice for about a year, but I've been in mental health for over a decade. I've worked in different populations, like. Um, corrections, community mental health, hospital settings, pretty much the gamut. Um, me personally, I don't feel like mental health has increased over the pandemic. I just think that we're grown to more a society that's more accepting of mental health illnesses and people are more willing to speak about it because these are issues that just didn't happen now. Like people have been going through depression, anxiety, trauma since the beginning of time, but I just feel like we're more getting to a place where people are being open and honest and authentic about what they're going through, whether it's even things like homosexuality, like everything is out there nowadays. So that's just my perspective of mental health. It's always been there, but maybe we just didn't have the terms and the labels and really didn't want to recognize things. And especially with Southern culture is a lot about you hear about like, let's just pray. I hear some of my clients and it's not about praying. Like we have to work towards introspection and working on ourself and really being mindful so it's just not praying. We have to do active work in conjunction with prayer, but that's my perspective. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Charles Willis, Executive Director of United Communities Against Crime. I'm a first responder when it comes to homicide. So I deal with trauma consistently, every day, all day especially amongst our youth. Um, it's extremely important to know how to identify, address, and arrest issues that plague our youth. And I believe that one of our biggest issues uh, in the city is 
having enough people, folks like you all, if we can only uh, uh, clone ourselves and there would be a million of us each that has this type of experience at the table that can identify, address the issue, then put it under arrest, then I think we would become a better um, community. And I, when I say community, I mean at large. So um, I can't say enough about how I have witnessed. Um, I sit here now with a, a photo of a, a little one that was murdered in the city of Richmond. Um, and uh, often I carry this with me because it reminds me of the youth that also experienced watching this little baby mm -hmm. murdered. So the trauma is real, mm -hmm. uh, the mental health is real, and a lot of our issues that we deal with comes from mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it starts as a youth. So let's just start with that, since that's the, the most recent, the last thing that was said there, um, violence, gun violence. Um, we have it in our neighborhoods, we have it in our schools these days, and it's something that affects all kids, no matter what color they are. Um, when you constantly live uh, around that or in that or have that kind of threat over your head, you're just in math class and you're worried about, will I get shot in school today? What does that do? to a young person's mental health. How, how is that taxing for them? Anyone please jump in. Well, one, one, one of the, um, I, I taught um, middle school in Richmond, and I actually taught the middle school where I attended elementary school, which was Mosby uh, Elementary, and then wound up being Mosby Middle. And I'll never forget one of my students coming in the classroom and he said, Mr. Willis, I saw a dead body this morning. And I said, ah, I'm going to sit down and be quiet, because I thought he was really trying to grab attention of the other students. And they started to laugh. And he said, no, Mr. Willis, I, I really I saw a dead body on my way to school. And I said, OK, yeah, well, we'll talk about it at lunchtime. Well, during recess, news report came on while I was in the teacher's lounge. And there was a dead body, a uh, black male. Uh, found in the Fairfield housing area of Richmond early that morning. And that's when it really hit me that our young folks come to school with so much heavy on their hearts and they see so much before they get to the school doors and they expect us as educators to sit them down, give them a lesson, and they're supposed to learn and then regurgitate that lesson and that's not how it starts. That's, that's, that's not how it starts. When they're full of anxiety yeah. and yeah. they're hypervigilant about what's going on and they're distracted by their anxious thoughts, how can they settle in and learn algebra? How can they sit there yeah. and concentrate? I can't concentrate on something when I'm upset mm -hmm. or thinking about other things. Um, it, so the level of learning is, is totally impeded when they're, when they're worrying about their everyday safety like that. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to mention too, because the education is a big piece of it, just, I brought this with me because I just found this the other day. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Children's Hospital Association got together and declared um, a, a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. So this represents 70,000 doctors across the country um, who are seeing unbelievable levels of anxiety and depression. Currently, one in four youth experience greater depression than they did pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. and one in five greater anxiety. And it was already high pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. So now it's, it's at catastrophic levels to the point where we have to do something. Mm -hmm. We have to get funding in place to get more boots on the ground, mm -hmm. to get programs in schools, um, like the Cameron Gallagher, mm -hmm. um, Grace Gallagher's not here, but programs to help kids manage to cope when they come to school with all that anxiety. Sure. And to have more services available, beds available for acute cases um, in the community, um, just services all around because there's not enough, like you said. Yeah, yeah. There's just not enough. And kids are, 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 are feeling it in their body and it's, in, it's um, distracting them from their learning and from their social relationships and from their behavior. Um, and it's impacting all levels of development in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we're at a crisis point. Now is the time to, to, to do something and to change something. Right. Yeah. I said to uh, Superintendent, I said to Mayor Stoney, I said to Superintendent Cameron and others, while uh, before they uh, allow the kids to go back to school, I had a conversation with them uh, and I said, mentally our youth, I don't believe, are ready. And we have to catch them where they are now. I think it's important that we talk to our youth while they are watching TikTok, while they're on the social media, because what has their attention now, while they're sitting at home, before we release them back out to the population, school population, we have to grab their attention and get them prepared for that. And I said it's extremely important that we reach them and we reach them now, because if not, then it's going to be like you can have a bunch of wild, and I'm not saying our youth are dogs, but <laughs> you, you have a bunch of wild animals in a cage and they've been locked up for so long and then you just open the cage and they're going to take off running, tan up everything. This is what you're seeing. Our, our youth were, were not prepared mm -hmm. to go back into our school system uh, like that. And that's, that's why you see, you see this increase of shootings at the schools. Yeah. It goes back to what you're saying. They, they, they're dealing, they're uh, not prepared emotionally. Mm -hmm. And because of all of this that has been built up from inside, TikTok, TikTok. And you know, I tell them, I said, everybody is into the TikTok now. You, but for me, TikTok, if you can remember, TikTok, TikTok, boom. The boom is happening. And that's why you have the 14-year-old that's going to the store for his mother and gets murdered and don't come back home. The nine-year-old that jumped out of the car to go in the store to get a bag of chips and he's murdered. The gentleman that neck is slashed and he's constantly stabbed. That's, that's a mental issue. That's not just somebody that wanted to do it. You have, whoever did that had a mental problem. Or the person that uh, uh, shot the young man and they drove him to the hospital and instead of waiting to make sure he was taken care of, they just left him there. But you took him to the hospital, but you left him there because they're dealing with things mentally that's not stable. Did you guys have something? I heard it. I was just, I was just going to say to, to the point of both of you all that when you talk about just not being prepared to come back, we rarely have had a conversation, or at least I haven't seen much of it, of what kids were released into when we were forced to go into stay-at-home orders, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that cases of domestic violence have increased. We know cases of substance abuse have increased. We know cases of child abuse have, has increased. So when kids, outside of school, School was the safe haven. Mm -hmm. And so we're mm -hmm. talking about exactly. the, having that snatched immediately to exactly. possibly have to go into environments where, um, that are not favorable for them, <laughs> that could be abusive to them, and not understanding the impact of what happened. We haven't talked about the impact of what happened to kids when they were when they were sheltering in place at that time. Mm -hmm. And then when you talk about being released and the, the, the analogy to being like, like just wild in that space, a lot of that is because of the, it could be, I, I don't wanna, I'm just making a generalization here, <clears throat> but it could be because of the conditions that were in the home environment that they couldn't escape. And when we talk about youth mental health, outside of just particularly the pandemic, kids are caught in the crosshair of the chaos of adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are. They do not have independence. That's they right. do not have autonomy. That's they right. don't have money to make decisions. Mm -hmm. They are caught in the chaos of adults, exactly. and and we don't focus on that. It's 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 it's. I'm 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 a social worker. I'm a a person in environment. So that's how I look at my my um, clients when I'm doing my work. We rarely look at the environment and how kids are very limited in what they can do. Um, I, I, I had the opportunity to work with um, Mayor Stoney's um, Youth Academy this summer with a group of kids. And one of the things that I heard over and over and over again is that my parents don't take me seriously that I'm dealing with something um, difficult because I don't have the responsibility of paying bills. I don't have a job. You don't have adult worries. So why are you feeling, quote unquote, crazy? Um, how dismissive is that? Mm -hmm. Is that part of the? I mean, that's part of the problem, obviously. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Kids have real, real issues and real yeah. things going on, but because they're not the same as whatever adults have going on, 
you're told near stuff's not important. Yeah, the inva invalidation um, is a big it's, deal. It's the, it's the huge invalidation mm -hmm. because what, what parents oftentimes may not be seeing is that your kid is responding to the chaos that's created in the environment that you're facilitating. And the response will end up being suicide. And the response. That's right. Yes. So I'm actually really glad that you brought up the adults because that's where everything starts is at home. So I'm like a little bit in disagreement with social media and stuff i feel like social media like yes it's a positive avenue but also there's a lot of negatives with it mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be putting our children in front of a screen and teaching them that way so my perspective of like helping children with mental health issues like we need to bring in the parents and educate them because we're talking about lower income communities maybe even the parents don't even have the words to articulate what's going on so we need to inform them and pull them in so they can help their children at home because i grew up in new york new york and it's like what you can think about is the projects like tall tall housing buildings like violence outside gangs and stuff and it's just they don't have the education the parents need to be educated about what is going on and as you mentioned the children are just the byproducts of like their what they're learning mm -hmm. from the adults in the community because the adults are the ones that set the example and children just follow their and, lead and i'm going to also say to that not only is it a, a situation that we see in low co income areas mm -hmm. i want to also challenge men or upper class areas as well too mm -hmm. because those are the kids that can fly under the radar Understood. as if things are going well and you don't know that there's actually chaos where money resides as well mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. so it's actually across the board yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's really across yeah. the board yeah. and in fact you brought up suicide mm -hmm. um this year between february and april they looked at suicide rates in youth, and, and for girls, it went up 40%. Yes. 40%. Boys it stayed fairly st up like 5 to five to 8%. Girls was a huge increase. Social media has been implicated in a lot of that, um, that social media has been a very negative, it had negative impact for our kids. They are inundated and saturated with all kinds of violence, all kinds of trauma, all kinds of negative messages from celebrities, and sports figures, and all around, all day, every day, to consume that every day of your life, it becomes part of who you are. So and that's the third time I've heard social media mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I wanna like read this real quick. This is mm -hmm. from the um, um, social work degree guide or something like that, social work degree guide. Yeah, that's it, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Essentially what it says is kids, generation of kids born after 2000, mm -hmm. um, they are literally steeped in technology, the internet, social media, and the pervasive ability to communicate anytime, anywhere, with anyone through their phone, and just about all kids have a phone, mm -hmm. this generation, they're called digital natives, have never known a world without these conveniences, and by the time they reach adolescence, so those later teen years, they can't conceive a life without them. Mm -hmm. To me, that almost sounds dangerous. What does that sound like to y'all? More generational trauma. I think a lot of generational, even with the parents, you bring them in, that's almost, to me, you know it's not an attack, but they're gonna take it as an attack. But mm -hmm. I think it's just nothing that they haven't learned from their parents, and they learned it from their parents. It's not like something does, you don't, a parent doesn't do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking back, and that's what I've been able to do since Cassie is step back and, you know, then I was like, I'm gonna take a real close look at my, or ask about my dad's relationship with his family. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Look at that, that's why I am the way I am. And that's, you know, it's not fault of him. And it wasn't fault of his mom and so on. It's generational trauma has a big thing to do with it. Um, and then I think our kids right now are in a state of constant fight or flight and it's survival mode. In, in, in regards to the social media, I think that it, it, does, it does not um, give the opportunity <clears throat> for kids to, to if, I'm, if I'm on social media platform, and I'm, I am a person that utilizes social media, not quite frequently, but I'm on there kind of hanging out. Um, if I was to take it as face value, I would believe everything in the world was great. I would look at friends, I would look at people going on trips, I would look at all of these things because they only show me Agree. the great things. Mm -hmm. And so we know with youth, and, and this could be anybody um, at any age actually, we can get trapped into the comparison mm -hmm. of that as mm -hmm. well too. So if I'm constantly inundated with images of people that are winning, 
and I feel like I'm losing, mm. I could never win. Mm-hmm. I'm setting myself mm. up every single day to feel like a failure because I don't, I can't live up to that, or there's a belief that I can't live up to that without the contextual information of, it's only about this big mm-hmm. of their life representation. Yes. It's, it's about just this much of what yes. their life actually is. You know, I used to, uh, when I taught school, uh, I taught special needs. They were SCD, severely emotional disturbed. Every child, I believe that every child can learn. And I would say to at the staff meetings, if a child failed, then the teacher has failed. They didn't like that. But how can you call yourself a teacher if no one is learning? You're not a teacher. They must learn. They must learn something. So we, we have set the youth up to go to school and you, know, you, you earn your grades. And if you get an A, wow, you know, fantastic. I use Riverside College, and Doc, you probably like this. Uh, When you came in, say, everybody sit down, be quiet, pull a piece of paper out, put an A in the middle of your paper and put a circle around it, put your name at the top of the page and turn it in, and guess what? You just earned an A for the day. Most kids have to go from the beginning to earn an A, but if you come in the door and you already have earned an A, then you have already met that winning achievement. And that's how I wanted them to start, that you all are winners. Even like when we would have, yeah, you're, you're not coming from depth. Right, right. So, media yeah, and yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Deficit. Believe right. me, I'm not t- attacking social media. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with Facebook. I got a problem with some of the faces on the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, where I see where we can help with the mental uh, uh, health, uh, the mental state of our youth is, you have to meet them where they are. You. Even, even, you know, it, it, scripture says, go in there, but don't do as they do. Mm-hmm. It talks about not doing as they do. So we as adults, we, we understand, we don't do as they do. But you have to sometimes, you, you have to put on your tennis shoes. So often, it, I wear suits all the time and neckties, but you know, folks see me in a pair of tennis shoes and jeans, they be like, oh man, you do got a pair of tennis shoes and jeans. Yeah, so with our youth, they have a language that we must, we must. And even at this table, I want to encourage you, please seek out the language, not the ebonics. That's, that's a little gimmick. Seek out the language. For example, if a youth tells you, and no matter what race they are, they tell you, say, you're doing too much, they don't mean you're working a lot. That means they don't like what you're doing, and it's just a little too much for them, and they're getting sick and tired of you. To like speaking their language. They, you're speaking their language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If they say to you, um, you don't feel me, they're not talking about physically touching them. They're saying you don't understand what's in their heart. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, a lot of times. If they say to you, uh, you're in the way, they may not physically mean that you are right in their way. It may mean, or not may mean, it does mean mm-hmm. that you're doing something that's stopping them and blocking them from getting from point A to point B. There's a TikTok video that pretty much, okay, I just recently got into, not got into, but looking at it, and there was some kid from the classroom, and the, the teacher was berating another kid, and I think the kid started to talk back at the teacher, and he was like, man, you got to, you got to you know, make them want to learn. Don't talk to them like that. Do you, anybody <laughs> see this? Actually, yeah. It was amazing. Right. Just like what you're right. saying. Yeah. And you, Inspire was, them. In that video, he she said, was dismissive of that yes. student. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and, and you right. see the teachers now, Fantastic. they're singing, they're rapping as the kids coming in the door. Because you're beginning to, to relate, you begin right. to ease with them, you can relate to what they did. That kid that came in and said, I saw a dead body, I took him for granted. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that, was, that was his life coming and you know it's a time where some kids when they hit the gunfire they don't run and get on the bed they run and get under the bed sometimes they don't run because multiply that by 10 and that's your environment over and over and over and over again yeah so i see a lot of shades of gray with social media and i'm a shades of gray type of person i still feel like there needs to be a balance because i do feel like social media it impedes social skills So these children, they're lacking the ability to communicate with people in person. They only want to do things like via text and it's shorthand. We're losing those communication skills for people to be self-expressive when we have all the knowledge out here because it's actually 
too easy for them. Mm -hmm. So I do like the grassroots way of like pulling people into a community, maybe like utilizing social media to get a word out about events. But I think it's so imperative to have people in person and not virtual. And still, that's why even with the pandemic going on, when I have new intakes and stuff, I'm like, I always prefer people to come in because you get more valuable information. It's that interpersonal skills. Like you just learn more mm -hmm. face to face and you feel more included. And also I feel like with social media, a lot of people are dissociating from reality. They think like whatever, like you were talking about, which I loved, like that people see these images and it's not reality. People only mm. put like their best face for it. It's they're scary. not gonna put, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not gonna put, we've all probably had some level of depression. You're not gonna put when you've been laying in bed for a week, didn't wanna brush your teeth or, you know, clean. And I think we've all been there with life because life can life be trauma, happens. life happens to the yeah. best of us, right? Um, and I, I feel like it's bringing out a lot of narcissism and stuff with children too, like grandiose personalities like very self-absorbed like mm -hmm. it's just very it I agree with you with the social media but then there's a big part of me I'm like it's just so toxic to where mm -hmm. I even as an adult have to detox from sure. like even though I have common sense and looking at this I like I can't look at this because I know it's not real and it's fake and I can see through the facade other people putting on images and stuff and that's toxic for children who can't differentiate, differentiate. between what's real <laughs> and what is not okay so what do we what do we do or how do we approach that because it seems very unlikely that facebook and instagram and snapchat and whatever else will ever go away i think we're just stuck with it yeah, from here uh, on out i'm glad to say that because you said but and i was giving to say tell me your butt because you and said that's what but that's what, what i was talking about but, utilizing so, but it what because make, I, I remember saying you remember the saying say no to drugs I started saying to folks, stop saying no to drugs unless you're going to tell them, say yes to what? But I gave my response. So the but is the but. to utilize it for like to bring people into the community, places where maybe there's like guest speakers pulling people from yeah, the community. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Use, that's, what I, that's what I was mentioning when I said I spoke with the man, the superintendent. Okay. For example, we know, we know um, recently I'm, I'm, a, I'm a production manager for concerts. I was hired to do uh, Richmond had a concert, Lil Dirk. Okay. One of the hottest yeah, yeah, groups out that. right here in Richmond. Don't you know that event had not one fight, one argument, one riot or nothing? Because thank God, the knowledge that God gave me to use with the promoters, we went into the schools and the first day of school, principals across the city had free tickets to give away to the kids. And we made sure they knew that. Now, kids want to see Lil Dirk. You got free tickets, you the principal, I'm coming to school. So now we got good Incentive, attendance. you're saying incentive. You know, yeah. and, and, <laughs> that token dirt, economy yeah. always so, works, you know, rewards. That, you know, so it's, it's stuff like that. So you're right, you, you know, using the social media was extremely important. And then, uh, not only we did that, but when we gave away, when we, when we uh, gave the tickets, we went Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. Because the kids use Facebook Live. So let's use it in a positive sense. I hear you over there, Doc. So yeah, so I'm thinking of something different. Doc. Now, <laughs> what I'm thinking about social media and kids is, is we found that social media. I do too. Yes, I do too. It's, 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 it's become it's an addiction, actually. <laughs> yes. So yes. they're Thank using you. it for 10, 12, 13, 16 hours a day mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic, all day on video games, all day on social media. And, and I, I actually address this almost with every single person who comes into my office. Parents are unsure of how to, 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 to start to control their children's <laughs> usage. And, and kids will literally go to the mat. I mean, they will fight their parents tooth and nail oh, on, on their ability to use it. So it's a constant source of conflict in families and kids do not want to give it up. Mm -hmm. Like in, in China, I don't know if you read this in the news recently, China, um, and I don't really like the way China treats people, but they, they actually limited um, use ability to use social media under 14. They can only use it on the weekends and holidays um, and some hours in the evening over 14 to 18. They can use it only between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. during the day. Mm -hmm. So like they're, like, that's how they're trying to crack down. We don't have guidelines for parents mm -hmm. on how to do this. Everyone, everyone's trying to fight their own battle in their own family. There's sort of no... Um, so good information for parents to follow. This is how you do it at this age. This is how you do it at this age. These are the things to avoid. These are the things to use that help kids, mm -hmm. help them with their communication skills, help them get engaged in different things. Um, these are the things that are destructive to them. So we're, we're all kind of like 
you know, flying blind, mm -hmm. and it's so scary. I want to ask you, Trish. So a lot of this, especially social media, was not as prolific, I think, as it was when your daughter was facing her battles. Right. Um, so what was the issue then, or what was contributed to the issue then? Um, well, there was a traumatic, uh, traumatic event when she was 10, but I, I was taking her to counselors. I, I saw her somewhat coming out of it. However, she had a surgery when she was 22, about 22, where she ended up getting MRSA in her bone. So she had had a pick line and a, multiple surgeries in a year to debris it and yeah. deal with that. And the doctor was just handing out the pills. And being above 18, I didn't know. I didn't even think about asking. Right. I, did, I didn't put even two to two together. Mm -hmm. It's too late. So then that's my other question, and this can, it applies to everyone, whatever situation a kid is facing. Um, as a parent, what is something that you know now that you wish you would have known then? Or what would you have done differently? I, that's kind of a, not a great question to ask, but is there something yeah. that comes to mind? Well, one, um, ask for opiate uh, you know, alternatives. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get an opiate for pain. Mm -hmm. Surgery doesn't even have to be done with opiates. There's different, there's spinal blocks. There's a lot of things we are not told, and maybe insurance should cover something that's a non-opiate, because from what I understand, Medicaid doesn't do that. You have to giving a certain opiate drug. They won't pay for the other kind. So if not, if not prying too much, uh, with the overdose, mm -hmm. was it the overdose of the regular medication, or was it that she made oh, that was, into something else? Oh, no, everybody, it's the same way. You start out, a lot of times you start out with prescription, that gets too expensive, you go to heroin. And it was a couple, it was probably about three years ago, I guess, that Cassie said, you know, mom, it's all fentanyl out there. She goes, I didn't That's know I was doing fentanyl. Was doing, yeah. She goes, there's nothing but fentanyl out there. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand is that that's a different ball game, not fentanyl. It's just the mindset of um, somebody with that disorder is going, hey, if you hear an overdose, you, know, you may not have heard this, if you heard of an overdose, you think people, why do, they, why do they stay away from it? You know, you know that person, you know, just got it from that person. That's what they're going to seek. They want that's, that that's drug that they yeah, overdosed yeah, on yeah, because it's yeah, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's the messed up and thing And they don't that, think they're gonna, they're gonna pass from it, and they do. They right, do. I mean. That, it, that's that's what, what I was it's curious It's that about. of a, just it's a backwards thinking that parents are not prepared to think that backwards. I mean, you think, oh, well, I'll just go get her help. We'll go to this rehab and that will work fine. Or we'll just go see the psychiatrist and that will be fine. Do you think a lot of times when the kids are dealing with issues around drugs and whatnot, whether they're in middle or high school or, or college or whatever, that parents are, are blinded? They think like, not my kid or I didn't teach oh, my kid that. So they, you know, does that play into it? And they don't realize they're self-medicating. Mm -hmm. Like you said, when kids are telling you, hey, I feel stressed, or you're not listening to me, I'm telling you how I feel, then they're going to self-medicate with something, mm -hmm. whether it be overeating and you, it could be, you or know. Or social media. That's or social media. Thing, yeah. It could be a host of anything. It's the fight or flight. You're going to choose <laughs> what you're going to do. Am I going to get into a gang? Am I going to go do, do softball? Am I going to, you know, it's how everybody. It, it's is, all around. Yeah. Am I, yeah. I going to go have a baby? Right, right. Yeah. Oh, oh, and with that is, a lot of times um, I've seen just covering stories and, and working in this job, um, young girls who find themselves in that position say they did that, you know, purposefully because they wanted someone to love right. or someone to love them. Mm -hmm. um, they want the attention. Right. Yeah. And the, the long term, obviously. Well, usually that's, that's the generational because you're mm -hmm. going to get kind of get that from your mom. And I'm not saying her mom was purposely X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm but she probably learned it from her mom. Mm -hmm. And she, and Cassie and I actually had this conversation mm -hmm. when it comes to, I blame the drug dealer. We had great conversations. She came completely open. I started not to flip out as a parent on everything because I've figured out, guess what? I can't control it. So I did the best I could and I started to listening and we had great conversations about, you know, people in the inner cities and people, people everywhere. And it's just, that she really changed my view of everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I, it's, I don't know how, I don't know how you fix this. It's so overwhelming, but it's a lot from generations. So it's gonna take generations mm -hmm. to heal because it comes down to healing and people, parents healing, mm -hmm. you know, 
they're probably mad at their parents going, why did she do that? I'm so mad at her. And, you know, if that child was to step back and look at that relationship with her mother, they'd be going, oh, now I see where she got it from. And it's, 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 it's almost comical if it wasn't me. Yes, that's that a curse. long discussion. Yeah. It's spirituality. That 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 and, that's exactly. like, and, and I, I don't work with people in practice, but I do work with parents that do have kids. And I'm, I feel like I'm more effective in that way. Mm -hmm. um, because if I can work with the parent to work on some significant healing, then it can impact the environment that the child is growing up in. 100%. And so, and so when, we are, when I'm working with clients that may be experiencing challenges with parenting, one of the questions that I ask them, and it, it's one that actually sits them back quite often, and it, it's not a question that is to be taken lightly. I, when they want to find out about, they, or if they're feeling just kind of lost in, their, in how their child is, is behaving, I ask them, are you feeling brave enough to ask, their, ask your kid what it feels like for, them, for you to be their parent? Are you feeling brave enough to ask your child, what does it feel like to have me as a mom? And really doing it from a space of not shaming. And, and of course, I'm having to work with a, a client that's at a place that has some emotional regulation and can really sit neutral with a question like that. But a lot of times, it's really difficult for parents to take feedback from their children about how their children are experiencing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it's, it's, a, it's a hard place for a lot of parents to be because a lot, it immediately it, it raises these defenses of, and, and especially for mothers, because a mother never wants yeah. to feel like they're failing their kid. Mm -hmm. But even your best efforts can be impacting them significantly in a way mm -hmm. that you don't want them to go. Um, and, and so we have to look at that when you talk about healing generations. We have to ask that hard question. Are you willing to have your child or sit with your child and have listen to how they answer that? Mm -hmm. What was it like for you growing up under me? Mm -hmm. And what can come out of that? Mm -hmm. and, how, and, and how it will be some pain that comes out of that type of conversation. But there can be, for a lot of kids, it is the acknowledgement. Right. Just acknowledge, yeah. just acknowledge that this thing happened between us. Just acknowledge that you kept us in, or kept me, because I couldn't go anywhere because I'm a kid, you know, but you kept me in this environment where it may have been unsafe or it may have been domestic violence. And then there can be an exchange between child and parent around economic disadvantages that play into all of this as well too. As much as I might have wanted to get you out of here, this is the best that I could have done at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so it, I, I think that that's a really hard space for a lot of parents to be in, but I think it's also critical if you want to really open up dialogue with your child and heal some of those behaviors, is that your, your parent, as hard as it may be, may need to know what it was like to be, for you to be their child. Mm -hmm. now, now, here's, here's the thing. Charlie, I find out, is that once you find out, because I have both four boys, all of them are grown, and I've had one or two come to me and say, well, you know, you did this with this one, and you didn't raise me this way with this one. The best thing that helped me as a parent is to listen and say, okay, mm -hmm. and don't try to fix it. Mm -hmm. Do not try to fix it. Do not try to fix it. Do not try to fix it. <laughs> Be no, that's very validating. Yeah, <laughs> do not try. To, yeah, <laughs> you know, do, do not try to fix it because what you'll find is that okay, I, I like what you said because okay, I, I wasn't the best dad. Okay, I wasn't there during this time. Okay. Uh, okay, I've learned not to even say I'm sorry anymore. And there are sometimes where I don't even accept apologies. Because I found out mentally, you meant to do it. You may have not wanted to be heard, or you may not have wanted to get caught doing it. But you apologize for me for something you meant to do. You don't have to apologize. Just don't let it happen again. You know what's interesting is that um, with the validation and fixing things, I'm a great codependent, right? And you know why codependents like fixing things? It gives us validation. And by fixing it of like, being my husband, my daughter, or something, we're taking the validation away from them for doing it and fixing it themselves. That was a hard one, and it's messed up, and you have to look back, and it's like, I'm not, I didn't do it on purpose. It's what I learned. So, 
I, I, I think one of the hardest things for parents to do is validate their kids. Oh, I don't know why, to that? validate their, their kids. Their kids when they're struggling, when they're struggling, like I have this, I have it. For parents to acknowledge, yes, I hear you, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Yeah, I think this is a personal thing for each one of us to learn about because I feel like a lot of people riddle with ego. Mm -hmm. So I say a lot of things like that to my clients, the adult ones, is to pay attention to your children because they've been with you for their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So obviously, their perspective of you is pretty much spot on. So an analogy that I like is like, we all in some way have blinders on. It's just like how you're driving in your car, like you have to turn around sometimes and boom, a car is right there. We have blinders about our personality mm -hmm. and things that other people see. And that person is just like, they're disillusioned. They have no idea mm -hmm. how they're coming across, but everyone in the room no. <laughs> knows, yeah. but they don't know. It's like the secret, yeah. but themselves. So people just need to be really mindful and open. And I know Leland, you like you were talking about like how do we educate um, kids about drugs? Like maybe there needs to be like um, mental health people in the schools create some type of pamphlets where we talk about age appropriate things that might come up around certain ages. Like I remember being in junior high a big thing that came out around that time was like cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Like people are smoking cigarettes in the bathroom. So like age appropriate things that may come up and send it home with parents. Mm -hmm. So that was my perspective. Interesting. All right, let's keeping time in mind. I want okay. to shit to racism. Okay. I think that is and prejudice. Mm -hmm. I think that is something it appears to me working in the news again mm -hmm. and just existing. <laughs> Um, that seems like something that kids today are really trying to like move past mm -hmm. or like make right mm -hmm. or fix if, if it can be fixed. But I think sometimes, um, I don't know, old habits I hard if <laughs> that works mm -hmm. for tradition in this country. Um, so, you know, a lot of progress has been made without a doubt. I think everyone agrees on that. But there's just still like some stuff that pops up here and there. And a lot of times I will say the, the one person that says or does something crazy tends to get a lot of attention for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not exactly a, a, a representation of like how most people feel. So keeping that in mind. But the question is, um, what does that do to children who uh, experience it? But also, is there some kind of effect on, on those who, who uh, perpetrate it, I guess? Mm -hmm. You know, do they have remorse after or do they, mm -hmm. do people do do things, say racist or prejudiced things or commit those acts knowing they're wrong and then feel bad about it later? Talking mm -hmm. about youth. And the ones who witness it too. Right, right. right. So what's the effect on the mind there? Well, for kids, they know nothing about racism until they introduce to it. Kids would see parents fight in the auger, and they would be ready to fight in the auger also. What I found with kids is, they would fight in the auger amongst each other. Five minutes later, they playing marbles, and they own the <laughs> monkey bars, and they, they, they're doing things together like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And it's us as adults tend to have to deal with it more, uh, mentally and emotionally than the kids do. So we have to sort of like, do reverse psychology, I mentioned it earlier. And that is, when you see your child fall, they, they, if a child is running and they fall, they're gonna turn around and look, because they know you used to running over and say, ah, you okay, you okay? Now I see a kid fall, I'll be like, ha, 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 you failed. <laughs> you get up, come on, get up, and come on, let's keep going. And they'll get up and say, okay, and they'll keep going. Or either they'll turn around and look and say, so you're not gonna holler, and you're not gonna scream, you're not gonna come running, like you know they do? Because that's what you know they do. Oh, I need to start yelling and crying and kicking. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to do that reverse psychology where uh, when it comes to racism, we have to say, hey, um, you know, yes, people are different. And God made us that way. Every, everybody's different. Eighty years ago, I couldn't sit at the table with these two ladies here. Mm -hmm. Eighty years ago. So how do you talk to kids about that? You know, and you know, when 13 to 19, yeah, 13 yeah. to 18. Yep. The one thing is, if they don't, if it, if you don't see signs of it, don't don't bring it up. That's for me. Mm -hmm. If you don't see signs of it, I didn't say if you, they didn't display it. If you don't see signs of it, because a lot of times the signs are there, and it goes back to my initial comments, is that we have to educate. We have to be educated to identify, so we can address whatever it is so we can put it under wraps. Mm -hmm. 
See, I feel like around that age from 13 to 18 years old, you can pretty much talk to that age group kind of sort of like adults. Kids around that age are extremely bright. Um, age of I, accountability. Yes, yeah. So with perpetrators of racism, and I feel really passionate about this as an African-American woman because I feel like racism happens more so. It's not in your face nowadays. It's on an insidious level. And if you don't have that type of awareness, like you're going to miss like the small signs that people are constantly doing to you or maybe like not taking you as seriously because of like, your skin color or whatever, or showing someone else favor, and you're like seeing these things on a routine basis or feeling like they can get over on certain people. So I feel like it's important because American racism, probably worldwide racism, it always comes back to a black and white issue. I feel like, you know, with minority populations, we need to teach them like some of the things that they might come up against because I was never taught this at home. So I was shocked and surprised, like having to experience it over and over. And then with maybe like white children, we need to teach them how they benefit from it. So I have a biracial son, but he's like white passing and I already have to teach him these things and he's bringing up colors and stuff at like five years old, but it's all about educating like how you benefit from something and like how you can help someone else and for people that benefit off of someone else's oppression, like how to recognize it so you can stand up for a group that is oppressed because I personally feel like as human beings, we're biologically, we're 99% alike, like complexion, hair texture, those are all minuscule things. Like we share similar DNA, blood, like blood type and stuff like that. But it's just it just needs to be a real conversation and stop living in a nation where everything kind of is like pushed under the rug or, you know, mm -hmm. if someone is very outspoken about the truth, uh, I mean, I've seen it even like in the workplace. If you want to bring upon changes or you talk about something, a lot of people are pushed out of the door. People don't want to deal with reality. I feel like, you know, people are so scared with the truth. You can lie to people all day and they're comfortable with the truth, but as soon as like you're truthful about someone's experiences or what's going on, you get pushback from people. Mm -hmm. So it's just about, about being honest about mm -hmm. what's going on and not being fearful and being able to bring different groups of people and talking about things and not being uncomfortable because I'm a black woman and like she's a white woman and I'm uncomfortable to talk to you about race. Like I want to feel comfortable talking to anybody <laughs> the same way. Like we need to get real comfortable with different groups of people and just because someone looks different than us, like not be intimidated. Right, and <laughs> you made a good point. You said that, um, or oh gosh, what did you say? You said if you don't see signs of it, don't acknowledge, but introduce it, I guess. Is this something, and, and kids typically like get along with each other, especially at this age. So considering this age group, is this something that kids are even thinking about? I mean, considering the news and what's I happening in the world, is this something that this age group, they're even considering? I don't considering? think that they have the language, mm -hmm. but I think that they can always trust what they feel. Yeah. So, <laughs> at that particular, at, depending upon the age group that we're talking about, mm -hmm. it, can, it can come down to exclusion. So what does it mean to be a, 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 a black kid or a child of color um, that's maybe in elementary age? And you might not have the language that this might be design exclusion that I'm not allowed to do these things, but you oftentimes might find yourself being the last person picked for a particular, mm -hmm. you know, fifth grade class, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And they already know within them that something about that feels really, really wrong. Mm -hmm. It feels really bad for them, but they might not have the language mm -hmm. to say what that, say exactly what this thing is that may be happening or um, just maybe and I will just put it out there, there can be preferential treatment by teachers to certain kids in classrooms that happen, whereas a certain demographic of kids may be getting more attention than other demographics may not be getting. They can notice that that slight is happening, but they may not have the language to say, something's happening where there's, there's a prejudice or a bias against me. Um, they, they, they can't say that, but they know the feeling. And, and so when we talk about, um, whether or not we should have this conversation with them. I think the conversation is being had it's even inside of their bodies that they know something is something is wrong. It's, it's very intuitive. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and then as you matriculate and, you, and, you, and you're exposed and you get more language in your vocabulary and all of those things, then you begin to start putting those pieces together. At least for me, that's how it came about. It wasn't outright conversations about um, racism, but I, I had a very clear idea, but I also grew up in a very different generation as well, too, um, where hip-hop introduced a lot of different concepts to me 
that normally wouldn't have been something that would have been conversations that people were having mm -hmm. with me, I was actually having those conversations with the music. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the music was able to bring up um, maybe discrimination or injustices and in what was happening in different communities. So I had the benefit, and I, I'm a music head. Anybody that loves me know, knows me that knows that I love music. So that's how I was introduced to a lot of the, the concepts of, of race. And then as I got older and just continue to live. I've had, you know, personal experiences. I've had experiences where I've done education around racism, bias, and different things like that. So I, I think that they know what's happening. They just don't have the language to say yeah. what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not as expressive as like an adult would and articulate. Yeah. Got it. But they do understand. They, they, they do understand. Kids but say, that's, that's not saying. right. You know. Yeah. That's not right. And I have kids <laughs> even coming in and telling me about things like that. I have um, one teenage client, um, young white female, and she's like telling me how she hears like jokes and stuff about other ethnicities and stuff, and she's feeling uncomfortable, but not knowing or not even feeling confident enough to say things yeah. to speak out. Because just think about when we were all teenagers. Eric Erickson, that phase of life is in an identity crisis, right? So we're trying to still, like, figuring out who they are. So it's hard to have that sense of, like, autonomy, like, to feel independent and to feel confident and to speak up about it at that age. So they know, but do they feel the confidence at that age? Because kids don't want to be excluded. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. as you get older, that's still a concept that's really important to mm -hmm. us. Definitely. We're talking, yeah, yes, you want to feel Social so much included absolutely. as a teen with your peer group so you sit in silence but I feel like we need to teach our children that it's okay to be an individual it's okay to be different it's okay to speak up about things and even if you're excluded that's okay too sometimes you're doing the absolute right thing and nobody will follow you but you're still doing the right thing mm -hmm. and I feel like that that's also the insidiousness of how racism works in in the country or just in the world and, and is, is the concept in the great lie of whiteness as being the superior, you know, ethnicity. It's not white people, the issue is with whiteness. And so when we think about them just being in a country that is white supremacist, patriarchy, male, heterosexual, Anglo-Saxon, I mean, we can give all of, all, all of the demographics of what that actually looks like. When you talk about what it means for those who witness racism that may be speaking out, and I'm thinking specifically maybe white white peers or white children or white teenagers. It's for some, I'm not saying all, to speak up against it, perhaps, or, or the, the crisis of conflict that may be happening, is to ask me to go against my family. You're asking me to actually go against the community in which I reside. And it can be so much of a terrifying loss. It's not that it's not that it's a belief that it's not important for me. It's not that it's a belief that I want to speak up when I see these injustices happening. And at the same time, to speak up against these injustices, I'm not saying it's an excuse, I'm just saying this is just a perspective. Gotcha. Um, to speak up against these injustices might mean that I lose my connection mm -hmm. to community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that is absolutely too devastating and a non-negotiable. Understood. It's Especially at that age. And, 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 so and, and, and that's the and that's ha that's the wickedness of, of how this how this thing works is that you can see it and you can know it and you can feel it in your being that it's wrong to treat other human beings this way. And the dice that I have to roll is that I either speak up against this or I lose my family. A or lot of times speaking up, it, in, it yeah. makes you to be ostracized whenever someone goes against the grain and that's a leader and that they speak up about injustices. And I've experienced that in my own life. So you're, you're speaking up about something that needs to be talked about, but a lot of times people just don't want to deal with it. They want to dissociate from things and kind of like live in this bubble because a lot of times people don't want to be uncomfortable. And, that's how and this is uncomfortable. And that's how it's harmful to whiteness. Yes. And yes. Too. Yeah, yeah, this definitely. Thing, this thing doesn't definitely. work for any of, of us. Course. Yeah, I mean, when, when, when we get to, it's just a matter of the pecking order on who it's going to get to. It's getting to, it, it, it primarily impacts black people, communities of color, but eventually it's going to peck its way right on up till it eats itself. So nobody benefits from this structure at all. No. Yeah. And a lot of what you mentioned there, I don't mean to, to pivot again, but I just want to respect your time. 
um, as far as speaking up against something and being ostracized or seeing something that's wrong and being ostracized for that by your friend group, the same can apply with sexuality. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of kids in this age group, you know, it's that identity crisis period of life and you have thoughts and feelings and they may not, they may go against what you were taught is right or wrong and that makes you uncomfortable and conflicted and that can certainly lead to, to mental health issues. Have you guys seen that at all in your practice? Yes, I have or? a transgender um, male, so that means biologically uh, female. Um, so even what shocked me is like even in schools nowadays, they have like um, gay, lesbian, like groups and stuff. Um, but so it's really difficult because I had a client and he's been with me for quite some time and it's just like with the whole family dynamics, even with the family, they have a difficult time with identifying with this child's new gender. So in a way, actually the families with transgender kids, they're experiencing grief, right? Because you give birth to like this one gender, mm -hmm. you put all your Every hopes, like I gave birth, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like, oh, I gave birth to an, uh, a girl, like she's gonna get married and like give birth. And then like your child that you put all this energy into turns out to want to live like another <laughs> identity. And of course, like we talked about, you know, a lot, I actually wanted to actually talk about bullying, but you know, a lot of issues that we have is everybody wants people to be alike, and what makes the world so great is that we're different, so it's okay if people, me personally, I feel like it's okay if someone else has a different lifestyle, that's how you wanna live, like you're not harming anybody else, so it's not for me to say anything, but see, a lot of times people have this conformist attitude, so trying to conform other people, that's when we run into issues maybe like, bullying that person or making them feel like they're not good as because they dress differently because of like their their gender their sexual orientation so um it's very uh, difficult ch children uh, youth who have um that, that go against the norm, the traditional, have like three times the amount of mental health issues. Yes, like yes, they yes, access yes. services at far greater rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably all see this too all the time. Mm -hmm. Because it's so difficult. It's a very difficult mm -hmm. road to travel at that age. You've got families that you've got to get behind you know, get behind you and you've if got they to support you. if they support you, yeah. friendships. Um, your community at large, whatever groups that you're involved mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult. They feel a lot of pushback, and um, you know we we don't have. I don't think we have the structures right now to support. It's great that schools now have sections for kids to be in that feel safe, mm -hmm. um, where they feel welcomed and they feel accepted. Um, but we don't have enough support for kids who are questioning and trying to understand who they are um, yes. to give to give them a safe space to do that. Yes. Um, because it is a time of identity formation in adolescence. You're figuring out a lot of things about yourself yeah. and your personalities and formation too. Um, so uh, you know, I, ha I have a lot of kids in my own practice who are um, coming out or considering a, a transgender and. Um, it, it just, it's an ongoing process. It's not even, it's not like, you know, you use anxiety treatment, there's an end point at about 12 weeks with, with us, you know, figuring out your sexual identity and um, forging your own path. It's an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. It involves family too. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of times it's therapy with parents more than it yeah, is with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where's the gap, where's the gap in services and help? For this issue, or really any of the issues we talked about tonight, because people who suffer with these mental health issues, Need a thousand more. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So that million, is there a shortage more. of mental health care oh, workers oh, oh. to address all of these problems? Yeah, I think you know, mental health workers they can also bring in their own biases. Mm -hmm. So like, so you mm. found I'm presuming you found us all in psychology. Today. I'm just presuming. No, I'm so, not. I did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like that's how I'm so, that's you know, people put yeah. down you know what their specialty is, right? So like, if you might type in a keyword like gay, lesbian, um, transgender, you might not have a lot of therapists that want to actually deal with certain populations. So that's an issue in itself. Mm -hmm. And that cannot really be resolved because therapists are human beings too. So they have their own stereotypes and biases. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like the schools are sort of this first point, like the first point of um, contact. Okay. Because they're, they're, they see kids all day long. 
Um, and, uh, and a lot of times kids don't bring home stuff to their parents and talk to them, but schools can provide information, just like you're saying on cigarettes or drugs. Mm -hmm. They can also provide other kinds of information. Definitely. And um, you know how there's peer recovery for, that it's big in addiction, peer recovery, mm -hmm. peer recovery specialists. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be an interesting idea to have someone be a peer recovery specialist for trans transgender or to t speak to that group? Of course. One on one at an age. I mean, I it's not always a counselor. Trans, it's yes, coming yes. to your level where you're at and go, I did, I've been there. Yes. When you haven't been there, you don't know. Because that's like telling a parent, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. <laughs> you do. Have you lost a child? No, you don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm glad so you said that because huge. there's overlap yeah. 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 in a lot of this. Yeah. And what works for one issue can certainly be effective for another issue. Sure. Yeah. Well, peer recovery is huge on any for any subject. Yeah. I mean, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important keys to understand from this conversation and pulling in the gap is what uh, um, Cassie's mom. Cassie's mom, <laughs> Christina. Or Trish. <laughs> is that, is that, I, I got it down in order. Uh, what Pat just shared is that when people figure they can identify because they have may have been through a similar situation, I see it all the time when I deal with the homicide families, when I go and attend the funerals, and people tend to say, I understand what you're going through. No, you don't. I see it in a totally different light when you, I see that on not. news now. Mm -hmm. Just because your son died, doesn't have my son any death means you understand what mm -hmm. I'm going through because that's your son. Mm -hmm. This is my boy, mm -hmm. and you have no clue. So with that, I can relate to it, but you don't understand. And you have to have thick skin about it. <laughs> you have to say, okay, you know, because they say some crazy things. You know, they'll, they, you know, they'll say, don't cry. What you mean, don't cry? That's God's way of relieving the frustration and pain. Mm -hmm. Cry, baby, cry, stick your finger in your eye. Matter of fact, I tell families, go on and have a crying party. God, Send out some invitations. It. And it's signed. Send out, because it's, it's, that's, 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 that, that brings, what they're doing times of doubt, people say some crazy things, and you have to just, Ignore. Well, it's a so that's where we're accustomed not knowing how to hold space for people in that way as well too. We're not accustomed to actually. We are accustomed as a as a culture to being addicted to like happiness and joy, and those are things that we should absolutely experience. But with that comes the exclusion of all the emotions on the yeah. spectrum. So we don't know how to hold pain very well. We don't know how to hold discomfort very well. So. It, a lot of people are very well meaning when they show up in that space, but a lot of time it's also just their reaction of not knowing how to emotionally hold the level of that type of heaviness that's happening, whether you know mm -hmm. you losing Cassie to suicide or the um, the homicides that you're seeing um, with the organization that you support, is that we're just not conditioned and taught in a at a deficit of how to really feel the gamut of our emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why we have to each one teach one. We, we have, right. We have, each one have to teach and one. If not, that's what, what's huge. the old saying? The, the African proverb: It takes a whole village to right. raise a child. Mm -hmm. Folks don't want to come out of the huts. Mm -hmm. They peeping out of the teepees, and that's not where the work is. Boots on the ground, we said earlier. And you have to have boots on the ground, and that's where the gap is filled in. It. We have to have boots on the ground. If boots are not on the ground, the gaps will not be filled. The kids will lead and they would do what they want to do. And it goes back to saying like this. In the educational setting, everybody's scared. Everybody's scared. The teachers are scared of the principals. The principals are scared of the superintendent. The superintendent is scared of the school board. The school board is scared of the parents. And the parents are scared of the kids. And the kids ain't scared of nobody. And everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we need funding for all that. We need funding we for the boots to, on the ground. We, have to, we, we have absolutely to, have to we have, have funding. To. Where would that funding come from? It comes from the government. We have to prioritize these issues. We <laughs> <laughs> don't prioritize them. That's what this okay. was about, too. Yeah. Like, we got, need, we need have, some yeah, more money. Yeah. We, we have got to. If do you're something. having peer support, I mean, not everything comes with a dollar tag with it. And that's what I'm tired of kids or, or even adults going, you know, your value is set by this dollar. Mm -hmm. So if you do something for free, that's, that's much bigger than you making one million a year. 
And so I kind of don't think there should, I think peer, uh, peer support is a huge, and it's a validation for them to say, I really got something I can contribute. I can help this other person out of no monetary reward at all, just from being a good person. Look, That's I, 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 I learned how to network my network. I, everything I do, United Communities Against Crime, it's a nonprofit organization, and I am the executive director of Crown. I can tell you what's in the bank account right now. Zero. Nothing. If I don't get support, like Doc is saying, from some kind of financial institution from the government, then I don't get it. And believe it or not, in the city of Richmond, I don't get a dime. Mm -hmm. But does that stop me from going to help the mother? That probably my phone is ringing right now, right. waiting for me to give her a call back. Because we have to meet, I have to meet with two families tomorrow to set funeral arrangements for the 14-year-old that was murdered and the 9-year-old that was murdered mm -hmm. and the other one that was sitting on the bus. So I cannot stop. I, 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 you're exactly right. Uh, because of the, the love I have for people and the know that people need that assistance, it's only by the grace of God that I move. And, I, and then the other part of me is, and you probably like this, is that I don't move unless the Holy Spirit tells me to move. <laughs> Last, last. He, he said, he said, come, and I saw the, the email and it said, we gonna, we got snacks. And I was like, oh, there you go, because we got snacks. Last but, question. But the, the heart of being amongst people that understands and want to have that conversation about youth is what really drove me. Last question, make it quick. <laughs> I think we're about to get kicked out of here. <laughs> um, so as far as getting resources and funding from government entities, uh, why does the government not prioritize um, these issues and working toward their eradication or fixing them? And how do we get them to do that? So I feel like that's a simple answer because mental health is, and I'm gonna be short and sweet, um, mental health is something that you can't see, right? Like if there was domestic violence or if someone hit me, like you can see a bruise or scar, but mental health, like you could be self-loathing and going through so much trauma mm -hmm. and then show up into like your workspaces and mm -hmm. just do your regular mundane Task and no one, you can't see mental health. You can cover it up with a veil and just <laughs> pretend. So it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. I can't see mental health, so we're not going to invest mm -hmm. in this. Do we need to figure out how to sh how to show it to and the people that hold the purse strings? Well, it's, or? it's everywhere. And children don't vote, so mm -hmm. yeah. that's a big mm -hmm. part of it. I mean, all kinds of children's funding. We, children don't vote. So we we, we it, have to find people to have a Our yeah. first lady, our new first lady, mm -hmm. mental health and addiction needs to be her cause. Mm -hmm. and it's I'm right. trying. Mm -hmm. I've been writing. That's, mm -hmm. she, she, uh, Doc, Doc said that fund, the funding is extremely important. Um, for me, the mental health stress release, because people say all the time, man, you, you got so much you deal with. You got, how you deal with that? How you deal with that? And once the cameras are cut off, I'm going to tell you how I deal with that. Uh, but I do, I, I do, I do, <laughs> I do, I do, I do deal with that. I, I have, I've been doing this for over 21 years, and this is not to promote myself. I've been doing this for over 21 years. I have never ever been on a vacation. Mm. Uh, people travel, they go here, they go there. I've never been. Number one, because I always, and that's part of mental health for me. I never thought I could afford to travel anywhere uh, financially. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have some stress release because this type of work and all of our type of work, even as mental health professionals, can be stressful on us yes. if we don't find that release okay. point. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tend to go to Roses on Melotia. <laughs> oh, so you're upset about the one, one vote, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's, right. and that's because the excitement, the, it's just, a, oh, it's please. different from, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. so it's just, different I and then I go home and cook I like to cook <laughs> so uh, I'll go home at two o'clock in the morning after out there at the homicide scene with the family I go home and cook me a full course meal and everybody said why are you cooking so late mm -hmm. I said well if I was working a late night shift I would eat dinner or lunch so I eat when the tummy said let's eat but those kind of things uh, being able to grab a hold and know who you are and whose you are helps the adult, and if the adult is helped, then it helps the kids. That's right. 
when I was married, my, my son's mother, uh, when my kids, never saw me and the mother fight. That, that was, and there were certain words that were not allowed to be used in the house. And I never forget, and I end minds with this, one of my sons said to me, Dad, I can't wait to grow up so I can get married and have kids too. The course of him knowing, the, the part of him, what joyed me the most was the fact that he knew he had to get married and <laughs> had kids first. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go, Cass, uh, Mom, Cass I just, I, I just want to <laughs> see if, if I can speak briefly, and I know that we're on time when you ask the question of why doesn't the government, you know, prioritize, you know, funding for mental health or violence and different things like that. And I think that it's a much, it's a much more complex answer to that. I think that there's a lot of things in play, which I think all roads lead to. And I can't, I know for time's sake, I can't, I won't get into how I, how I conceptualize that. But all roads lead to having to look back at yourself. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about gun violence, when we're talking about homicides, when we're talking about domestic violence, when we're talking about um, youth mental health and those things not being funded, the, the onus of responsibility for me goes back to those who pushes those communities into the margins. They're not, and, and pushes, not only pushes them into the margins, but then slaps the label of, well, this is just how they are. They're responding to a condition. That they're better. They're responding to a condition, and what we're not questioning are the forces or the entities that are actually pushing them to, to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. That's where the actual mirror work of, 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 of individuals that are in power have to look, what am I doing that actually, what do I create in legislation? What am I not creating or considering in legislation that continues the perpetuation of certain, demo, of certain things happening within certain populations, and how do I contribute to that? And for a lot of people, that's a really hard look to look at. This is how I may be impacting the, the conditions and the behaviors. Every, every, everything, everything is a result. I've always told my clients, every behavior has a need attached to it. So when you see people acting out violently, I don't know if I necessarily quite understand or, or quite believe that it's all mental health. I think that it can be some mental health there, but I'm also wanting to open up that conversation to look at environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. Every behavior has a need attached to it. The, the, and I think a lot about the, the city of Richmond and, and, and how we move. There's some amazing things that are happening here, but there's also a high demographic of people that are being left out of enjoying the economy of what's happening right now. First and foremost, we're seeing it with housing. It is absolutely astronomical right now. So if I can't meet my basic need of housing, I have a condition pressed upon me that may begin to influence a behavior that might not be accepted in the community that I need to be a part of. It's almost that whole thing, I'll burn a whole village down so, every, so I can feel the warmth. I'll burn this whole thing down for, to, 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 to make my point that I need housing. What we need, or what I would hope, is to have people that are in positions that can actually influence legislation to say, how am I contributing to that? So it, it really is a lot deeper, meaningful mirror work of just saying, how do I play a part in this? Or how do I play a part in the exclusion of some, I mean, the, in, in the inclusion of others? Policy's got to stop being yeah. instant gratification instead of when you do make that policy, you've got to think of not only the positives or what is the, what is the harm you can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's what a lot of things have happen is you forgot about the harm. Mm -hmm. Because they need to have empathy, though. And that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> right. 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 Part two. Part yeah. two. Right. <laughs> all right. Again, thank you all so much for coming. I would love to keep going. I just, these folks have been generous, and I think they're yeah. coming to tell us to leave soon. So, again, nice to meet all of you. Yeah, you too, um, I may be in touch at a different date. We hope to do these kind of conversations uh, ongoing at CBSN. Okay. So, okay. I'll reach back out. Thank you. That may be why. Thank Sounds you. good. All right. <laughs>